I am so tired of waiting. Aren't you? For the world to become good and beautiful and kind. Let us take a knife and cut the world in two and see what worms are eating at the rind. Hello, and welcome to Words That Burn, the podcast taking a closer look at poetry. This week's brief poem is Tired by Langston Hughes, is undoubtedly one of the most famous figures, if not the most famous figure, to emerge from the literary movement known as the Harlem Renaissance. He is not the first poet of the Harlem Renaissance to be covered on this podcast. Gwendolyn Brooks and the oft-overlooked Fenton Johnson have also featured. Both of those episodes are linked below in the description. As I said, Hughes is easily the most recognized of that time, and for good reason. Throughout years of intense segregation and racism, Langston Hughes found a way to address audiences on both sides of the divide. This is a deceptively short poem, and a wonderful cure for the notion that real poetry, and I use heavy air quotes there as I say it, is somehow lengthy and wordy. Here, the poet lives up to their reputation as an accessible poet. This poem, Tired, seems designed to reach as many people as possible. It does this in several ways. It avoids putting people off with the so-called wall of text. It refuses to cloak its meaning in abstract imagery or ornamentation. Instead, Langston Hughes chooses to deliver a succinct and impactful call to action, masquerading as a lament about exhaustion. It seems lately that I am drawn more and more to poems that look unflinchingly at the state of the world. That is to say that many of the poems I'm reading are written in reaction to the conditions the world finds itself in, or rather, the frustration of comparing the world as it is to the way we feel it should be. In a modern sense, I think we all know how the world should be and are increasingly dismayed at the fact that nothing seems to be pushing it in that direction. That sentiment is encapsulated perfectly in the first half of this small poem. I am so tired of waiting, aren't you, for the world to become good and beautiful and kind. Here, Hughes begins to weave his communicative magic. His use of direct English is augmented by his choice of format. That second line, aren't you, is inviting us directly into conversation with them. This is no great rallying cry, and so avoids the crushing weight of the responsibility of a revolution. Rather, it is an appeal to our human nature through emotion, the most common of human emotions especially today. I'm so tired of waiting. Anyone reading or listening feels seen and heard. Those words sing to us, inviting us gently to discourse, to unburden ourselves and recognize the tiredness we all feel. He increases that appeal through simple language. Verbs like good, beautiful and kind are unambiguously positive, impossible to be misconstrued. That small list is a reminder of everything Hughes does not see in the world around him. Many of Hughes' poems were short and to the point. For the simple reason which he stated directly was to explain and illuminate the Negro condition in America and obliquely that of all humankind. He took that goal even further by mimicking the cadence, rhythms, and techniques of African-American folk music and blues. Here he is discussing it briefly in 1967. Uh, I wasn't aware at that time of one of the things that I did in this poem. 
I was aware that I was trying to write free verse on rhyme poetry, but quite unconsciously, I have a little refrain that suggests the Negro spirituals. And later on, I quite consciously began to try to create poetry in the style of our folk songs, our spirituals and our blues and our work songs. This poem is not only for one side of segregated America, but hopes to illuminate that condition to all humankind, and I think does so very successfully. This broad appeal made Hughes a natural leading figure of the Harlem Renaissance. As academic Cheryl A. Wall put it, the project of the new Negro Renaissance, as it was then called, was to achieve through art the equality that black Americans had been denied in the social, political, and economic realms. Segregation was the law in much of the United States, and the practice in the rest. Despite the creation of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, founded in 1909, and the National Urban League, founded in 1910, the fight for equality had been thwarted. In creating these direct, non-alienating poems, Hughes found himself quickly becoming the Harlem Renaissance's most popular writer. Given the nature of this poem, it's even less surprising that Hughes found himself becoming a political figure. I am definitely not the first to notice this poem's appeal. In 2020, the poem experienced a resurgence of sorts, being shared like wildfire across social media. Writer Jasmine Harris documented the phenomenon in an article, writing, The poem has been posted all over Twitter and Tumblr since late May, in response to the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. In simple words that clearly resonate, I found a Tumblr post with 20,000 notes and a tweet with more than 28,000 likes. Harris goes on to note that while the first section appears everywhere, the second section of the poem is often left out. Let us take a knife and cut the world in two and see what worms are eating at the rind. There is an air of the French Revolution in that second part. Nothing too obvious, nothing that could be misconstrued as a blatant call to violence, but enough to incite action in the listener. Let us take a knife is hard to ignore as a metaphor. The poem has moved from a gentle sharing of exhaustion to a plan of action. Hughes wrote this poem in 1930 and was no doubt aware that things were not changing for black people in the United States. He was acutely aware of injustice in the world. In 1937, he gave a speech which echoed the sentiment of this poem. We are tired of a world where when we raise our voices against oppression, we are immediately jailed, intimidated, beaten, sometimes lynched. And Hugh's sentiments were echoed by other writers of the Harlem Renaissance. I mentioned Fenton Johnson at the top of the episode. He also published a poem entitled Tired. But what sets his apart is that it ends in bitter acceptance of the state of the world. Hughes would not grant himself or his reader this escape. His call to action demands a removal of the things that have made the world so. There is a recognition in the words, cut the world in two, that this undertaking is a Herculean task, that it may leave the world unrecognizable. But for Hughes, only a radical course of action will reveal what worms are eating at the rind. That final line is insidious, and one that burrowed its way directly into my own mind. I could not shake the notion that some systems in the world were rotten to the core. It is no wonder then that this second half is often omitted from social media posts and Pinterest. It lacks the gentle appeal of the first half. Its lines are full of sickened frustration and quiet radicalism. 
What was once a soft poem exploring the exhaustion of modern life becomes a subtle yet consistent demand for action from Hughes. There is a strong subversive tone at work in the poem. This subversion was well-trodden territory for Hughes, who spent much of the 30s exploring alternative ideologies, the type which might deliver African Americans from the dystopian conditions they were forced to endure. Many years later, however, in 1953, these political poems would come back to haunt Hughes, as he was forced to testify before the Senate Permanent Subcommittee of Investigations, led by Senator Edward McCarthy. This era was known as McCarthyism and was, for all intents and purposes, a communist witch hunt. Following this experience, which was harrowing, as Hughes was alleged to have undergone torture prior to the trial, the poet stepped away from radical poetry and chose instead to refocus on the natural world and beauty. Despite that, the legacy of this poem endures. It instantly struck a chord with me when I read it. And based on what happened in 2020, it did the same for thousands of people. It addresses the unease that many of us feel daily, that something is rotten in the state of Denmark. For Hughes, it was civil rights. In 2020, it was Black Lives Matter. And those issues of systemic racism have not gone away. Little progress has been made, and Hughes might just be dismayed to see how little that is. The poem could apply to any number of modern anxieties. Climate change, political corruption, a distinct leaning to the right in politics. It is enough to make anyone exhausted. Crucially, however, Hughes reminds us that all is not lost. Through collective action, let us take a knife. We might somehow set the course of the world right, but more than that, we must not give in and succumb to that tiredness that is so omnipresent in modern times. What did you think of the poem? I'd like to point out as always, that this is my interpretation, and as such, very much up for debate. If you'd like to get in touch with me and talk about the poem, or if you enjoyed the poem in general, you can get in touch with me in a few different ways. I'm on Instagram at Words That Burn Podcast, and you can find me on Twitter at Words That Burn. If you'd like to check out previous episodes of the podcast, you can check out my website, www.wordsthatburnpodcast.com Or, if you'd like to read the show notes, check out the Substack link below. If you really enjoyed the episode, please consider leaving me a review wherever you listen. It would really help me out. I also have an additional favour to ask this week. The Irish Podcast Awards are currently open for voting, and the Listener's Choice Award is is linked below. If you've been enjoying the show, please consider voting for it. It'll only take a few minutes. This week's episode was written and produced by me, Benjamin Colopy. The music in this week's episode was by Mattia Vlad Morleo and is used under license. You can find a link to his work in the description. Thank you very much for spending some time with me for this episode. Come back in two weeks' time, where I'll be taking a look at the poetry of Anne Carson. <laughs>